The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast host and guest and do not necessarily represent those of our distribution partners, supporting business relationships, or supported audience. Welcome to Transacting Value, where we talk about practical applications for instigating self-worth when dealing with each other and even within ourselves, where we foster a podcast listening experience that lets you hear the power of a value system for managing burnout, establishing boundaries, fostering community, and finding identity. My name is Josh Porthouse. I'm your host, and we are redefining sovereignty of character. This is why values still hold value. This is Transacting Value. We know we're not curing PTSD. We know we're not curing anxiety. We're not curing any of those things. What we're trying to do is show our guests there's a way to face those things. Today on Transacting Value, what is it about our value systems that help us get unstuck when our identities and our roles in society no longer match? More importantly, what do we do when our values don't either? See, sometimes we get so ingrained into thinking one way that we don't realize it's inauthentic to ourselves. And unfortunately, in some cases, especially in the DOD, that causes things like veteran suicide, domestic assault, domestic abuse, and a host of other issues. On today's conversation, we're talking to the founder of the nonprofit Charlie 22 Outdoors, Scotty Hettinger, all about what it means to help rehabilitate yourself and your team. Without further ado, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. Scotty, what's up, man? How you doing? Josh, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing real well. Listen, I, I appreciate you taking some time out of your evening. Uh, you're central time, I'm pretty sure, right? Sir, yeah, Missouri, yeah. Yeah, okay, so early evening at least. But I appreciate you taking some time out of your day so we could sit down and talk. You've got such a cool, cool story. I mean, across the board, you've got, well, you know what? I'm not going to tell your story. You came here for a reason. How about this? Take a couple minutes and let's just explain to everybody. Who are you? Uh, where are you from? You know, what sort of things have shaped your perspective on life? Well, my name is Scotty Hedinger. I am in Missouri. A little bit about me. I'm married with three children and, and five grandkids. We actually married our youngest daughter off to a young man on July 7th this year. So we're empty nesters now. And we live in Missouri, as I said. We have um, been married 22, 20, 20, 26 years. <laughs> I've got to count backwards, 22 years now. But um, I'm from the Army Brent. My dad was a career soldier in the Army. He passed away when I was 15 from leukemia. And my first 15 years of my life, I had 25 addresses. Addresses? Places. Yeah, yeah, 25 different addresses in 15 years. Yep. So I said he passed away when I was 15, and, and I went on to graduate high school. and got a basketball scholarship to play in college, and was paralyzed in a car accident in 1990 as a sophomore. I was a teacher for 15 years in the high school uh, system in, in South Missouri. I retired in 2011. And I uh, did this type of thing that I'm doing now for another organization, and Left that group in 2016, and, and 2017, Charlie 22 was founded. And here we are, completing our seventh complete year. Congratulations. And Across the board. Just say, well, it's, thank you for saying that. It's been a real blessing to do what I do and, and meet people I get to meet and talk to and places I get to go and then I get to see. It's really it's very humbling to say that. Blessing and humbling, humbling at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine it is. And then on top of that, you said a car accident. I'm assuming 19, 20 years old? No, I was 19 when I was paralyzed. I turned 20 two months later in the car accident. And what happened was we were close to the end of the semester that year, my sophomore year, my, my first semester of my sophomore year. And finals were coming up a week later. And I went to a party with my buddy who uh, uh, was a soccer player not at the school. And, you know, to celebrate the end of the semester. And I woke up in the hospital and I was told I was paralyzed. And... Backstory is we was a, we were drinking and he was driving my car and hit a, a parked car head on and, and I had whiplash in my cervical fourth and fifth vertebrae which paralyzed me from my neck down and I couldn't talk I couldn't breathe I couldn't do anything I couldn't move anything I was paralyzed from my arm down, down. and um it was tough the fourth day of being being in the hospital they came in the same day the doctors and nurses and they were checking my my vitals and stuff my my body stabilized so not to have surgery. And uh, went in and had 15 and a half hour surgery. It was be 34 years ago this year, November. So 15 hour surgery, what they did is they took two ribs on my, my right side of my back, the floating ribs, and they are now wired in my neck with three wires to my, my cervical three, four, third, fourth, and fifth vertebrae. What? Stabilized my neck. 
Yeah, that's what they did it back then. It was pretty incredible. They took those floating ribs out and literally placed them side on my neck on both sides and wired them together like like just a and made you a splint. splint. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that was in November, thirty-four years ago, and then. About a month later, less than a month later or so, I was sent to Craig Rehabilitation in Denver, Colorado. And I got there. By that time, I could talk. A little bit later, they would plug the vent so I could speak. And I began breathing more on my own. And I remember, remember that process. It would go 10 seconds with no ventilator, and then 20, and then 30, and then a minute. And I tell you what, Josh, those were some long seconds sitting there trying to take that first breath in. That was the key, getting that breath in. And if I could do that, then I could obviously I could expel the air. And um, what well, at first, the first time I went to a minute, you just counting down, you know, thinking, am I getting ready to pass out? Am I going to be able to get this breath in? And then it, then it happened. You know, with the two minutes and then five minutes and ten minutes and so on. And then about three weeks into the process, my shoulders began to move up and down a little bit. And I'm laying there in bed. Shrugging my shoulders left and down as much as I possibly could, and my biceps started to move a little bit. Went out there, and I'll never forget the very first night I'm there. They walked in the room, and the vent tube of my throat was like the size of a quarter. And they took that thing out, put this little bitty pencil thing on my neck, and said, This is what we're going to work with. And I'm like, Wow, oh. getting ready to cut my air down. Man. And it was probably one of the best things that happened to me because then it forced my body to really work on that breathing in and breathing out because when you're paralyzed like i am i know you can't see see me very well i'm literally paralyzed from my chest down now right from the right below my like your sternum sternum yeah yeah there you go yeah and um i can't move my triceps or my fingers so my diaphragm is still paralyzed and that's a big part of breathing in and out yeah so, so my body had to overcompensate learn how to do that without diaphragm control and i was blessed to be able to do that Whoa. So I spent six months there and I came back home. And uh, you talk about being emotional. I apologize in advance, okay? Oh, you're fine. Um, no, please. I turned 20 out in Colorado. I had friends that came and visited me from Missouri. And when I got back home, what stuck out to me was the fact my life had been put on pause and all my friends' lives had been gone. Mm. And I did not expect that when I got back home. I you know, probably been waiting on me. I didn't think that way. But I didn't realize the extent of that till I got back home. They had all moved on. Uh-huh. Some of the guys, some of the, oh man, I'll tell you, it was, it floored me. I couldn't drive. I was 100% dependent on everything. Some got engaged, some were graduating college, some moved on in careers, and mine came to a screeching halt. And I came back home and I faced that reality. For some reason, I'm telling you this because being a college athlete, I was used to that. Workouts, you know, where you, where you wore yourself out. You were, you worked out to the point that physically it was just drained. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that. So I hired a personal trainer to come to my parents' house that first summer and um, I wanted to drive again. I, mean, I could barely move my arms when I came back home. I was so weak. And he came out to the house and he said, I don't know how to keep somebody paralyzed. And I said, That's why I'm hiring you. I want you to work me out like I'm not paralyzed. I'd get into the pool and I would swim back and forth, you know, on my back with the life jacket on. And that was a funny process there too, because I wanted to get my core where I could use my core. <laughs> he'd get me in the pool, he'd turn me face down in the water, and I would put myself back over. That was the goal. And if I couldn't do it, I would just go limp in the water. I just stopped. And that was the signal. That was a sign to him to turn. Uh. That was probably the smartest decision. One of the best ones I ever made when I was first coming back home was hiring him because in a matter of three or four months, I went from having a hard time moving my arms, pushing my chair, my, I was in a manual chair back then, down the road two, three miles and pushing back to the house. Really? And, um, oh yeah, it was the, one of the country out there where my parents live. I had a mistake the first time I did that because the first part of that trip was downhill all the way. <laughs> I, I knew it was, but I didn't realize how hard it was to come back uh -huh. So I came back up, and it was a two and a half hour. And he was never been to it, two and a half, three hours. Those were all things that I did because I knew to get where I wanted to be was going to take that effort. I, I did not want to be, well, I didn't want to be where I couldn't function and be independent. I wanted to be independent, the best that I could be. 
And then January of 92, I got my, my first vehicle, my first van. And, so you do uh, drive? No. Well, yeah, yeah, let me back up. That was 93. I didn't drive for almost two and a half years. Yeah. So <laughs> let's go back to my friends again. <laughs> huh? You're, you're, just, you're well, blowing my mind here. So you're saying you didn't drive for almost two and a half years, sort of like, you know, uh, that was a long time. Yeah, but like you were paralyzed. So really, you, it's surprising that you're even able to drive today, you know, <laughs> and that was 30 years. Like it only right. took you two to three years to be able to drive again. That's huge. Whenever I went somewhere, it was a friend or a family member taking me. Yeah. Okay. Required transferring me in and out of the vehicle. Now I'm I'm six four, you know two twenty five. Back then I'm probably about one eighty. I lost so much weight. Yeah. But you still have to maneuver me getting, getting me in and out of the, the car. Okay. So that wasn't easy. We did it, and to be able to drive independently, I wasn't to be in a manual chair. I had to be able to get up a ramp into my van. And remember, without triceps or hand movement, just imagine pushing the wheelchair wheels with the palms of your hand. I'm trying to grab it again, you're going backwards. Yeah, no fingers. So, no fingers, exactly. Yeah. And um, never forget that that first time I got up that ramp, my uncle came to visit me from Oklahoma. And we went outside, and I just felt strong enough to do this. And I pushed up that ramp by myself, and I knew then, okay, I, I will be able to do this. All righty, folks, sit tight, and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. VA Disability Compensation is a monthly tax-free payment to veterans who got sick or injured in the military and to veterans whose service worsened an existing condition. You may qualify for VA Disability Compensation for physical and mental health conditions that developed or worsened due to service. Learn more at va.gov disability. We went outside and I just felt strong enough to do this. And I pushed up that ramp by myself and I knew then, okay, I, I will be able to do this. My friends still came and went. My girlfriend and I, we broke up. And I'll never forget, before I drove, one of the best conversations I had was with my best friend. I'm telling you, I was really struggling emotionally and mentally with what, what my condition. He knew, he knew my frustration. He said to me, what do you want us to do? I said to him, you know what? Not a damn thing. Mm. That's what I that's what I want. And that set me on a pace to become independent as possible. So Matt were, were you angry? Or I, were you I, no, I was, were you like trying no, to push yourself? Or what was the impetus for that? What angle were you coming from? I was mad at my situation and I was mad that they had all got to move on and I couldn't. Oh. Mad at him. I wasn't mad at them. I was mad at what I the situation I put myself into. That yep. that accident was our so then when I got that viewpoint, that I don't want them to do anything for me, this needs to be me doing this, that's when I really began to see the progression of, of the work. And finally, in January of 93, I got that van, and I tell you what, it changed everything. I bet. Everything. Yeah. I mean, it just did. I, I went full-time in college. I drove. I began to date again. I always knew there was a plan for me. God had a plan for me. I didn't know what the plan was. I knew it was going to be in some capacity of helping people. Maybe it was teaching my story to kids, you know, keep them from my situation. So uh, when I originally was in college, I wanted to be a physical therapist. And I kind of threw that out the window. He said that last semester, 1994, and I've been, been asked to go do a commercial for seatbelts. And I <laughs> chose my old gymnasium where I played basketball. I had to do the commercial then. So That's interesting. I still remember today was me sitting there. And you don't see the chair. You hear the basketball bounce, the basketball bounce. You hear me talking in the background. I said something like, all kids dream about playing in the NBA. I was no different. And then it showed highlights of me playing and dunking the ball and all the things. Video of my high school career and put it in this commercial. Then you hear this click, click, click the seatbelt three times. Now my dream has changed. I just want to walk again. And it shows me in the chair, the seatbelt on me, holding me in the chair. It was a great, great PSA. So went down to the principal's office and went in his office and I said, what do you think about me coaching basketball? What do you mean? I said, you think I can do it in this chair? And he said, Scott, how many guys do you see coaching right now in college NBA that can't play anymore? And Jay. it just hit me. Yeah. He's right. 
I knew right then I wanted to be a coach. I went the next day to the college and I said, the fastest way for me to be, be able to coach basketball is what? And it's a social studies teacher. I said, sign me up. <laughs> this is, this is the honest to God truth. Gosh, this happened. So I left there after that meeting with that, with that principal on that commercial. And I thought, God, if I need to coach, give me a sign. And I kid you not. I got a phone call that night from a lady here in Joplin asking me to come coach the, their homeschool junior high, high school boys basketball teams and the high school girls basketball team. They didn't know who I was. Didn't know what just happened an hour earlier. They had no clue in my mind I'm thinking about coaching. So I got that phone call out of the clear sign. Did that for 15 years. Let me retired 2011. Let me ask you so first off, yeah. again, I, I don't understand how many times I can say congratulations before it sounds ingenuine, but I'd still mean it. Uh, I think that's a huge accomplishment to to for one, to be a coach of anything, I think for especially an enduring amount of time is a huge accomplishment because you've got to deal with so many different conflicting personalities, especially in high school and junior high. They don't even know their own personalities and you got to juggle all that on top of your own doubts and your own self-image and any high schoolers being high schoolers. I'm curious because I saw on your website, Charlie 22 Outdoors. It's not Charlie 22 Indoors. What was your appeal? Obviously, physical activity makes a difference. My wife and I, she's an amazing woman. I just got to say that real quick. My, I am maybe the most blessed man on earth with who I was able to marry. She's incredible. So we, we knew each other as kids. And when I first moved to Missouri, my dad was having with fight leukemia. And um, her cousin and I became good friends. So going through high school, we were really close, him and I were. So I saw her off and on and then never really dated. He wouldn't let her date me because we knew I was kind of a turd back then. But um, <laughs> we bumped into each other in 2001. I was buying a rental property that my parents owned. I'm at the clothing office, the clothing office up there, Carthage, and I see her walk in. She didn't see me, but I saw her walk in. And I kid you not, and this is going to sound cliche, but I thought, my gosh, she is just beautiful. And she walked on by me down to the back of the building, never saw me. She came back, and she saw me, and she came back. And I kind of saw her from that, so I was going to see if she would respond to me. And she did just run next to me after I was doing So we began talking right then, and we went on a date the next two weeks later and so on. And we began dating, and, and I knew within, you know, two or three months I was in love with her. And then we had got married, you know, asked her to get married me. I hadn't hunted when I was a kid, some with my dad. That was kind of his outlet. He home me fish or hunt. I felt this desire to hunt again. I don't even know what it was. I don't know if it was a connection to my father. I don't know what it was, but I wanted to hunt again. And um, everything I found was way too expensive for me to afford to hold a gun for me to, to hunt with. And um, I decided one day to go over to Bass Pro. The main headquarters of Bass Pro is in Springfield, about an hour from where I live. So I went over there and looked around over there, and all their stuff was the same way. Nothing I could really use or too expensive. And at that store over there, there's a huge So I don't want to watch the fish for a minute. In the reflection in the in the aquarium, I saw this guy go flying by me in a wheelchair, a power chair. And I could tell by looking at him, hey, he looks a lot like me. I chased him down, and I said to the guy, and it's probably a weird question, but do you think yeah, I'm every year? Why? And I said, How do you what do you do? I said, everything I see is a thousand two thousand dollars. I can't and he said, I had this rack built for my chair, I was shrimp metal by my buddy where I live. That's so cool. we got that design back home. We had, had it built by a local, local machinist. And we literally we took scrap metal out of their trash bin, their bin right there in their shop. And the next day it was done. $25 later it was done. Whoa. That winter I borrowed my uncle, went to his property. And in Missouri you could actually hunt out of the van or out of the vehicle with a, with a disability. And um, I had that permit. So I went to his property and, and I borrowed his gun. And I got me a gym that year. And I told my wife, oh, I'm doing this. That was great. I found something that was physical that I could do that required real physical effort to accomplish and be successful with it. And I I found that. And it wasn't easy. And I really, really, really took to that because it was a challenge to figure it out. So I did. And and I went and bought some equipment. And I've done it ever since. So that's that's where the outdoor part comes into play was that year in in 2003. Well, so then what I also saw, Charlie 22 was the company battalion brigade that your father served in. And so what is the draw towards that unit? What's the appeal? Okay. So 
You're part of the Make a Wish Foundation. You see it on TV about yep. kids with illness and so on. Yep, yep. Kitchen Foundation is the, is the outdoor world for that. Oh. They go having a picture for these kids, okay? Cool. And met the president of that group in February or March that year. And um, Friday before Labor Day weekend, I'm told this. So on Monday, before uh, Memorial, uh, Labor Day weekend, I set up a dove hunt for my daughter because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to hunt with her ever again. And I knew right then... I'm alive for a reason. I'm a, I'm, I think I'm a good husband and a father, but it's a bigger purpose. I don't know what it is, why I'm still around. It's a bigger purpose. It was God got a plan for me. My body was just drained. Just It was just like the energy was just gone. And I went to church October 7th, I believe, of 2017, and it preached on Joshua 1 9, and it said, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid of discouraged. For the Lord, your God, with you wherever you go. And I knew right then. I just knew I'm doing this. It just, why am I not doing this? I got a passion for it. I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'm I'm good at it because I love what I do. And I call. I've got three guys in mind: Curtis King, AJ Stock, Russ Wickwood. Those are the three guys that I want to approach about this ministry. So I call Curtis, who's a retired Green Beret. I call him and tell him, I want to do this ministry for months. He's the outdoors. Because I know my own experience, hunting and fishing is very therapeutic. Just being out there in, the, in that environment, that creation, just is very, for the soul, it's just good. Okay. So I go to bed that night, and I'll talk to Curtis the next morning, and I wake up in the, in the shower, and it just hits. Charlie, two, two, outdoors. Because you probably know this already. In the United States, there's the term 22 a day, and that refers to 22 suicides amongst our veterans and soldiers every day. Studies are saying it's higher than that, but that's the number everybody uses, 22 a day. So it honors the 22 a day because of the 2-2. And then it also honors my father because when I was a kid in Leonard Wood, when I was, how old was I? When I was five, six, seven years old, he was a drill instructor for Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Brigade. And as I said a minute ago, when soldiers and vets hear that name, they get it. Oh, that's military something. What's it about? Civilians ask me, what's that mean? I got to tell them what that means. So they understand that now too. Alrighty, folks, sit tight. And we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Alrighty, folks, if you're looking for more perspective and more podcasts, you can check out Transacting Value on Wreaths Across America Radio. Listen in on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, and TuneIn. When soldiers and vets hear that name, they get it. Oh, that's military something. What's it about? Civilians ask me, what's that mean? I got to tell them what that means. So they understand that now too. So it's, a, it's really a pretty cool way of uh, using that name. You know, something else interesting too, you and your dad both made professions out of being coaches. I think yeah, that's kind of uh, interesting it, too. It, Maybe uh, apparently it's in your genes. You're exactly right. He, it was a different... He was working for coaching soldiers, right. uh, coaching basketball players, and uh, but you're right. It's just teaching people how to do their do their job or what they're going to be doing. Well, mm-hmm. I think, yeah, at the forefront it is. But, yeah, it may be how to perform, say, physically in any particular sense, but emotionally, mentally, how to align your identity with what you're doing and, you know, mind-muscle memory and recognition and autonomy and independence, obviously courage and integrity and teamwork. Speaking of teamwork... That gets lost, especially when you leave the military. I guess you're on a team, right? You've got a family. You've got a support network in most cases or, or something to that effect. You and your dog, maybe. But it's not usually actually just you, but it feels that way. And I think there's a lot of organizations that talk about, like you mentioned, 22 a day or suicidal ideations. But that's not where everybody goes. That's more the extreme end of where most people could go there's not the same degree of purpose and clarity when it's rooted and defined by you taking care of a team and you come second. But when that reprioritizes after your contract, after your retirement, whatever happens and changes after a divorce in some cases, the identity crisis sets in, you buy a motorcycle, you go skydiving, you go do crazy stuff to try to fill a void that you don't know who you are anymore. How do you guys, or how do you, recommend instigating that and filling that positively? How do you, you said it's a ministry. I mean, how do you advise towards that as a consideration? 
So you're out, you're hitting the nail on the head. I have countless times I don't have this anymore. Yeah, perfect. I want to go back to the ministry founding because our first event was in January 2018. Yeah, so we found in the 17th, first event was in 18. I'll never forget this. And it was key that it was one of the first things we did because the story that I heard really hit home with me, okay? So this vet comes to our event, and after the, at the conclusion of the event, he tells me this. He says, Scott, in October, I retired after 33 years in the military. Mm. 33 years. And he said, I have no idea my purpose. Do I have a purpose anymore? What am I going to do with myself? And Absolutely. This, this hunt has given me direction and purpose again. He said, you think about it, every decision in my life has been made for me. What I mean, he said, I graduated high school 33 years ago, and I was in boot camp a week later. Yep. And school, target bells, we went to where it needed to be. There was dress code. I ate the school lunch. I did what the coach told me, what the teacher told me. I'm in boot camp a week later, and ever since then, the instructors and the officers, the DIs and the officers have told me what to do, where to go, when to go, what to wear, all those things. Even my food was given to me by that. And he goes, yep. I have zero idea how to be so Zero. And he was suicidal there in Tennessee there for the two or three months. Yeah. I didn't know this until the to the so that hit home with me right then I realized, wow, I never really thought of it that way. Yeah, absolutely. You and you probably you know what I mean. You you leave the military. You said a minute ago the team is gone. You you had a you had a bond with the soldiers you worked with, the certain back. That's they, they're they're still doing what you were doing. They still are in service, so they may be retiring as well. And when you wake up tomorrow, what are you going to do? Yeah. Where well, that's, that's exactly what happened to me. I just got off my active contract last year and I stared at a wall for two weeks. I was like, I don't, I didn't know anything. When to get up, what to wear, what to do, what to say, how to perceive the world, let alone creatively, critically interpret it to do something about it. Not a clue. Yeah. There's so much professional development now, present day, and a lot's changed with the DOD in 50 years, but there's so much professional development, regardless of branch, when you transition out of the military as a retiree, separation medically or otherwise, doesn't matter. Everybody goes through this transition assistance program and it's meant for professional development. Where the deficit exists is personal development. And I think that's where some of these issues that you're alluding to fall as gaps in that identity and character development. And, and I think what you're doing, or at least what you're providing acknowledges that opportunity and encourages that fulfillment and empowers that sort of discovery. What about rewiring or maybe even reconditioning? Because it sounds like you've had to, for a few reasons, a few times, but you just mentioned it, right? Like you're 18 years old, you join the DOD, let's say as an example, or you're a military child and you never do, but you get that sort of exposure, right? 18 years old, graduate, your brain's still forming, how to think and act and perceive the world and make your own independent decisions. And in that window, the final, what would you call it, six, seven years of neurological development, you're still not thinking for yourself. And so is it really that much of a shock that six to eight years to 33 years later, you don't know how? Well, you never learned. You never had the opportunity. And so you got to reteach and rewire and recondition your thoughts, just like you did when you first ended up in a wheelchair and then it sounds like subsequently three or four more times since then for you. How do you work through that process? I think it may be a bit different for everybody, but like, what are the generic steps to try to get the traction and move the train? I could use an event that we would conduct to make an example of how, how we go about things. The ministry is not trying to provide a hunting or fishing experience for a veteran or a spouse retreat or whatever. Those are what draws us together, okay? But we learned very quickly years ago that you, you understand this, and I don't, Josh. Veterans and soldiers can relate to each other in ways that civilians can't relate to them. I think okay? so. So yeah. when they come to one of our events, we have veterans there intentionally from previous events for them to meet or people that are still serving. And that bond automatically is formed when a person arrives to one of our events says, I'm, I'm a Marine, or I'm in the Navy, or I'm retired, or whatever. When did you serve? That right there, the connection is established, okay? And then the activity takes place, whether it's hunting deer or turkey or, or catching a, a fish or whatever it is. 
it's all created doesn't together for a reason. We want to show that there's God's grace still for everybody, whether you served or didn't serve, where you've been or or not. I hear a lot. How can I be forgiven for what, I, what I've seen, where I've been, what I've done? How can I be forgiven for that? And no, you don't learn that. That was something that Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. We know we're not curing PTSD. We know we're not curing anxiety. We're not curing any of those things. What we're trying to do is show our guests there's a way to face those things. Mm. So dark times do come. You have somebody you can turn to in another winter corner. And then if it's not me, it's AJ or it's Russ or it's Marilyn or it's Barbara, whoever it is, you can turn to them and they'll be there for you to help you get through what you're going through. Sometimes it's as simple as one thing we do at all of our events is we give out challenge coins to our guests and it has our logo on it and it has our verse on it, it has the different branches of the, of, the, of the military on it and so on. And they're really, really nice, nice challenge coins. They really are. That we didn't spare any expense on them. We give them to our guests, letting them know when the dark, dark times do come, just grab your coin, know them in your corner. And I actually got a photograph today sent to me with one of our board members. And that's the way the veteran saying, I need prayer today, thank you today, and we talk today. And that's what it is. It's a photograph of a coin in our hand or on the, their table. That's, that's just their way of saying, please help me do this. And a text back to them is as simple as, what do you need? I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. And I think when a vet knows that somebody still cares and is there, that may be all it needs for that one that day or that moment to get them through them to the next day coming up. And when they realize people still care for them and they're still loved, they have God's grace, then they can start thinking about, hey, my purpose now is what? Yeah, that is cool. I think once you find ways to remind somebody that there is still structure, there is still a team. It just looks different than what you're used to. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Spot on. Then they go home and they think about, how can I share the other vets what I was just given this last weekend? I got a phone call earlier today from a vet we had an event last year. who's was thinking about a really cool idea about starting a, a garage with three bays in it where he can work in two bays to make money and third bay is there for vets to come and, and work on their vehicles at no expense. Oh, that's a cool. great idea. Yeah. I mean, that's his way now of sharing what he's got talents in, showing grace to veterans that need it at his place. Yeah. So cool. it doesn't have to be hunting and fishing. It's, you find your talent, whether it's, we, we, do, we do horse therapy now, we do knife making, we do couples retreats, so there's not going to be hunting and fishing. There's other ways of getting to people and showing them there's still a reason. you still got a purpose, and it just looks different, and let's find out what it is. All righty, folks, sit tight, and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Are your demons winning? Even when we have the skills and fortitude to be strong, sometimes our demons are stronger. Thanks to organizations like Charlie 22 Outdoors, support is en route. Now, our nation's veterans and their families can still belong to a team with a unified front to serve those who have already served. Charlie 22 Outdoors believes that even one case of veteran suicide a day is too many. With Charlie 22 Outdoors, veterans and their families can find reception, staging, and onward movement following the seemingly complex ambushes that post-traumatic stressors can bring. Bring the revitalizing impact of outdoor events like fishing, hunting, hiking, and camping back into your weapon stack. Maximize the clarity and purpose with all expenses paid trips nationwide to include travel, lodging, meals, tags, and licenses. Go to charlie22outdoors.com for more information. That's charlie22outdoors.com. There's still a reason. You still got a purpose. And it just looks different. And let's find out what it is. I like that a lot. A lot of what I think carries resonance and relevance, especially in my experience, to get through all of these changes and sort of arrange and manage some of the chaos of re-identifying yourself and your role or realigning your identity with your role even, is understanding that there's a certain initial common reference point for every individual's character development. And I think that's what gets rooted into a value system as individuals. And so to be able to say, I don't know who I want to become. I don't know who I want to grow into. I don't know who I'm going to grow into or what my character is going to look like at that point. 
but I know the qualities that he's going to have are going to be inclusive of these particular adjectives, these values, helps. And you can root that directly into whatever aspect of service or past life you used to have in that identity and say, well, when I was serving or when I was teaching or when I was coaching or when I was doing whatever, I did that because I enjoyed duty or honor or sacrifice or courage or commitment or fill in the blank. But you can still have those. You just exemplify them in a little bit different in arena because you can't bring a 240 in, into a Walmart. You can't bring a, an AR or a radio system in a pack 12 kilometers to get to, you know, the grocery store. It just doesn't fit the same environment anymore. So neither can you, but all the skill sets could, you know, the communication, the artistry, the humanities, the social sciences, like you said, when you became a basketball coach, not every coach can play like they used to, but you can still have an impact and an influence. And I think that's huge, man. Everything that you've been describing sounds like it's directly, well, correlated with what you've done throughout your entire life to this point. And it sounds like, especially from what I can see on your website, it's exactly what you're continuing to inspire and instigate for other people. I have a question for you, or really two real quick. This is a segment of the show called Developing Developing Character. character. Developing Developing Character. character. It's really in your own words. I'm going to tie the two questions together for the sake of time. But in your case, what were some of the values that you were raised on? And then if any have changed, what are some of your values now? Well, being the son of a drill drill sergeant, you can imagine the discipline that we had (laughs) in the home. Yeah. And in times have definitely changed the way people raise kids. And I don't want to compare the two, but back then you did what you were told to do. And then if you didn't, there was, there were consequences and living on base back then, <laughs> you get a kick out of this, the neighbors, yeah, I'd be down the road doing something dumb and I'd get in trouble with that father or mother or that soldier or whoever was in that house or in the yard and saw me doing it and dragged by my ear to my, back to my house being spanked the whole way. <laughs> and get there, and then tell my mom and my dad what I'd done, I got it again from them. So, you know, I was still a kid, made dumb choices, obviously, but um, discipline was something I learned to that household, and then I always use the word hard, and I mean work hard, read hard, pray hard, love hard, serve hard, whatever you do, do it hard, meaning give your all. Whatever that moment is, give your all. And when I was in high school, when my dad died, my high school coach became my father figure, and he was the same way. Do what you're going to do and do it. <laughs> Give your all to it. Whether it's basketball, mm-hmm. whether it's being a, a, a boyfriend or a husband in the future, or raising or being a father, you don't care what it is. Just do it hard. So that's probably what stuck with me ever since I was a kid. And that probably goes back to the part when I started seeing the fruits of my, my therapy when I was working out. Because I did it as hard as I possibly could. And then... The thing that's probably changed as I've gotten older is serving others. Because when I was in high school, I was serving myself, playing basketball and girls and parties and things. That was serving myself. It was all about me. And then when I got into college and moved on to teaching and coaching and now what I'm doing now, I viewed that as serving other people and putting them first. And my family put my family first, put their needs before mine. So that's probably the biggest change. I still do try to do what I'm doing hard, meaning all, all that I have, but I also have changed now where before it was about me to it's about others first. In my household, in my church, and we're trying to do too. I think that's where we are now. That's the change. Yeah, that's super cool. And then obviously getting that conveyed to other people to sort of pay it forward, I think inherently gives people purpose. If for no other reason, then it buys them time till they can figure it out on their own. Exactly. But by giving somebody an opportunity to help somebody else, even if it's temporary, it's purpose. And yeah, that's, that's powerful. My last two questions for you. One of all of these experiences, and I I really now after hearing your entire story, I feel almost kind of dumb asking this, but how have all of these experiences actually helped you to instigate your own self-worth and your own sense of self? Because obviously you view yourself differently now. I did an interview, it would be two, two summers ago. And um, the, the last question the guy asked me, which was probably one of the most powerful questions I've ever been asked, he said, what did you learn about yourself with Charlie Two Two? And it, it just, I hadn't really thought about that. And what, you know, I don't I hadn't really thought about myself in that capacity. What, what did I learn about myself since I've been doing this? And I started thinking about it for a few, few minutes. And kind of answer the big question you just asked me is, 
when I put others first and really put them first, and I seek, seek God's grace in doing so, and then get out of my own way long enough, good things will happen. And what I mean by that is, yes, I know that I'm serving other people. Yes, I know that we're trying to show people their, their, their self-worth and their self-purpose and so on. But it can't be about my personal agenda. Mm. It's got to be about them first and, in, and showing grace, whatever it is we're doing. And that seems to be the formula that I see that works. The mission doesn't say to show or doesn't say to go hunt deer in Turkey and catch fish. That's not what it says. We have a mission that it says to show a hope and a love and personal meaning that comes out of God's grace. I don't care what we're doing. That's the mission. It always be it will be successful because if we do that and keep that first and foremost, it's always going to keep others in our focus before ourselves, and we'll keep their personal agenda out of the out of the, the, the formula, out of the, the mix, and it's going to resonate with people that we're trying to help. That's what I learned about myself is that putting others first with that mission mission in mind leads to success. And when I'm gone, they keep doing it the same way, it's going to continue to be successful with new people. Man, congratulations. I don't even know another word to say, man. That's such a powerful realization to have. And I think it's fair to say that not a lot of people have it. And certainly not a lot of people have it more than once in their lives. And the amount of moments that somehow you've either come across on your own or pieces you've put together from advice you've gotten from other people, you've been able to do it multiple times. You really are inspiring in what you've accomplished in how you've been able to do it, in what you've decided to do with it, and all things considered, at least from what it sounds like, what you're actually enabling other people to do to pay forward as well as a sort of third generation of coaching and teaching and mentoring and guiding and empowering. It's just super cool, man. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to showcase some of your story. But for whatever I can't encompass, namely 45 years in an hour, uh, where do people go? How do they find out about you or Charlie 22 Outdoors or find you on other shows? Whatever they want. Where do people go? Well, I'd like to say this before I answer that question. We've all got our roles, Josh, and getting the word out is a key role. And you're, and that's, you're doing that. So whenever we do an event, last week we had our banquet and I told nobody there, the family is how we battle or battling the PTSD, the anxiety, the suicide. It takes a family. It's not... Scott Hedinger thing, it's a Charlie two, 2 family thing. And your role is doing what we're doing now, getting the word out. So thank you for that. But mm. to reach me or reach us, simple, is to go to our website, charlie22outdoors.com, and go to the contact page, and you'll find me right there. You go to our Facebook page, it's the same thing, Charlie 20. And I, I say Charlie 2 2 because of the way it's phrased when I was a kid. But we look us up, it's literally Charlie 22 Outdoors. Facebook, Instagram, we're on Twitter. I guess it's called X now. And you have our, our website, which is charlie22outdoors.com. They can call me, they can email me, they can text me, they can message me through social media. There's many, many ways to get a hold of me. And I promise everybody this. This is as true as it was seven years ago, and it's the same thing today and I'll continue to be. When I get a message through a text or an email or a voicemail, you're going to get a reply. Mm. It's, it's 100%. If you, if you just call me and hang up, I don't get anything. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to call back. Home. <laughs> but if you send, you send me a voicemail or a text or, or a way of talking to me, you're going to get a reply. So how do they want to get a hold of me? Whether it's through those social media outlets or through email or phone call or whatever it is, they will get a response. I love it. I love it. Rising tides raise all ships, they say, whoever they are. I'm sure they still say it. Yeah, I love it. For every, anybody who's new to the show, depending on the platform you're streaming this conversation on, Click see more or show more. And in the drop down description, that's where you'll see links to Scotty's website, social, and you'll be able to reach out and get in touch with him there as well. Um, I know you've got plans this evening. I know you've got a life to get back to. Uh, you spent so much time, effort, and energy crafting it. I don't want to take it all from you now in this conversation. So I, I appreciate it again so much being able to showcase your story, your insight, your advice, and obviously what you're doing for veterans, their families, their spheres of influence with Charlie 22 Outdoors. I really do just appreciate your time. So thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. And I hope I've alluded to this, but when somebody supports us with what they're able to support us with, I don't care if it's financial, 
prayer what we're doing right now, that motivates and humbles me both because that to me means that what we're doing in your mind makes a difference. And how can I not be motivated by that? You know, when somebody writes a check, they want to see it go forward. When somebody emails me, they want to see it go forward. Somebody interviews me like they're doing right now, they want to see it go forward. So thank you mm. for, for that. Because I said, it motivates and humbles me both. I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Values still hold value, man. So yeah, hang on to it. Keep doing what you're doing. That said, to everybody else who tuned into our conversation, new listeners and continuing, thank you for listening. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your effort. And obviously any feedback, if you guys want to get involved with Transacting Value, or you want to listen to any of our other conversations as well, you can go to our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com. You can listen to all of our seasons there. You can also reach out, leave us a voicemail. If you've got any time, money, talent, advice, insight, whatever you've got, feel free to drop a review and let us know on the website as well. And we're playing on all streaming platforms. Thank you to our show partners and folks. Thank you for tuning in and appreciating our value as we all grow through life together. To check out our other conversations or even to contribute through feedback, follows, time, money, or talent, and to let us know what you think of the show, please leave a review on our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com. We also stream new episodes every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time through all of your favorite podcasting platforms like Spotify, iHeart, and TuneIn. You can now hear Transacting Value on Reads Across America Radio Eastern Standard Time, Wednesdays at 5 p.m., Sundays at noon, and Thursdays at 1 a.m. Head to readsacrossamerica.org slash transactingvalue to sponsor a wreath and remember, honor, and teach the value of freedom for future generations. On behalf of our team and our global ambassadors, as you all strive to establish clarity and purpose, ensure social tranquility, and secure the blessings of liberty, or individual sovereignty of character for yourselves and your posterity, we will continue instigating self-worth and we'll meet you there. Until next time, that was Transacting Value.